Hi everyone, my name is Nari. And I'm Samira. And this is your crash course to quantum mechanics. It's everything you need to know for test number three in 15 minutes. Yep. And periodic trends. Okay, so ionization energy. You need to know it for the exam and it's actually a really easy concept to understand. You just gotta find a way for you to get it in your head, to understand it. All right, and hopefully my analogy will help you guys. So ionization energy is defined as the, the amount of energy required to remove an electron from um, a gaseous atom. You guys need to be aware of that because Rogers ha does have a tendency to test you on the definition of that on the exam. Think about an old lady walking down the street and she has her purse held out like this in front of her. She's walking down a pretty sketchy road. So it'll be pretty easy for someone to come and yank that purse out her hand and, you know, rob her of her money. Whereas, what if a lady was holding her purse close to her chest like this and walking down the road? It's going to be a lot harder to steal that bag than the bag, than, uh, as opposed to the lady who's been holding her bag like that, right? Ionization energy is the same thing. If the electrons is closer to the nucleus like that, it's going to be a lot harder and it's going to require a lot more energy to steal those electrons, right? Whereas if the electrons are out like that, it's going to be a lot easier to steal those electrons. So what pulls in the electrons like that? The protons. The protons pull in those electrons, all right? So the proton is pulling the electrons in, inward, which makes a, um, the size smaller, technically. That's why... Um, you would look at the nuclear charge in order to determine which one would have the higher ionization energy. And typically, the one with the highest nuclear charge would have the higher ionization energy than as opposed to the, an element with a lower nuclear charge. Okay, so this is typically the type of problems you'd see on Dr. Rogers' Dr. Rogers' exams, right? So you'd have um, either the second ionization energy compared to the second ionization energy of a certain atom, or you might even have the fifth ionization energy compared to, compared to the third ionization energy of a certain atom. It really just depends. So we've got the second ionization energy of lithium, and then we also have the second ionization energy of beryllium. And the steps Dr. Rogers advises you to do is to first always write down the electron configuration for both. And then you'd write down, and then you'd look at the nuclear charge or the amount of protons available in each atom. The electron configuration for lithium is 1s2, 2s1. And the electron configuration energy for beryllium would be 1s2, 2s2. Guys, I want you to guys to note this. We're looking at the second ionization energy. That means we already took off an electron for the first ionization energy. So technically, lithium isn't in this step step anymore. Neither is beryllium. So lithium already removed an electron, so we might as well just look at it where we are right now, right? So we'd remove this electron right here, and we'd be in the 1s2 shell. And then beryllium would be in the 2s1 shell. So now we're looking at the 1s2 um, electron shell of lithium, and we're looking at the 2s1 shell of beryllium. Since they don't have the same electron configuration. We can just look at that. We don't need to really look at the protons or the nuclear charge. So lithium is in the 1s2 shell. Beryllium is in the 2s1 shell. Beryllium's shells, th this is beryllium's outermost electron. This is lithium's innermost electron. That means that it's going to take a lot more energy to remove an inner core electron than it is to remove an outer valence electron. Because those valence electrons, they're, st they're not being held in as tightly as those inner core electrons. So since beryllium still has its valence electrons out in the open, it's going to require less energy than, lithium's inner, than to remove lithium's inner core electrons. So that's a concept you should be aware of. The ionization energy of inner core electrons are always greater than the ionization energy of, than of valence electrons. So saying that, lithium would have the greater ioniz second ionization energy than beryllium. Hopefully that helped you guys. We're going to be moving on to harder problems in just a minute. Okay, so this is a different type of problem where we're comparing 
two different ionization energies. So we're looking at the third ionization energy of boron compared to the second ionization energy of beryllium. So the electron configuration for boron was 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, right? But we're looking at the third ionization energy. That means we already took off the first and the second, so we're look we took off two electrons already. So let's go ahead and do that. So 2p1 minus one electron would leave us in the 2s shell, minus one electron would leave us in the 2s1 orbital. All right, same thing for beryllium. The, its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. But we've already, we're looking at the second. That means we've already taken off one electron. So let's go ahead and look at it like that. So right now, we're at the 1s2, 2s1 shell. We have the same electron configuration. So now that we've already looked at that, we can check that off. But now we can look at the protons or the nuclear charge in order to determine which one has the greatest ionization energy. Boron has more protons than beryllium. So since they're in the same shell, we look at the protons or the nuclear charge to determine which one would have the greatest ionization energy. And boron has more protons than beryllium. So I remember that old lady, if she's holding her purse in like that, that means she's gonna be, it's gonna require a lot more energy. And the protons are pulling in those electrons like that. So beryllium, they're not really pulling it in that much compared to boron where they're pulling it in like that. So since boron has more protons than beryllium, boron would have the greater uh, ionization energy. So the third ionization energy of boron is greater than the second ionization energy of beryllium. So I want to talk to you guys about the exceptions because there are exceptions and believe it or not, Dr. Rogers will test you on those exceptions. So the first exceptions are the column 13 and the column 2. And so therefore you'd have a P sub 1 subshell and an S sub 2 subshell. And so if an electron is located here, and an electron is located here, you would typically think that this ionization energy would be greater than this one, right? Because this one is in column 13, it's farther away, it would have a lot more protons pulling those electrons in, and therefore it's going to require a lot more energy to remove this, right? No, that is just not the case. It would require a lot more energy to remove this, and you just got to remember that. So my way of remembering this exception is actually really disgusting, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty trashy way, if I do say so myself, of remembering this, but you know, it helped me, so whatever, right? All right, so think about you have to use the bathroom really, really badly, and you just can't hold it in, and you're like squirming around, and people are just like, just hold it in, just hold it in. And you're just like, no, it'd be so much easier if I could just pee. So since it's easier, it requires less amount of energy, so it's always easier to pee. That's my way of remembering it. I know it's really gross, but honestly, it helped me. So hopefully it will help you guys too. The second exception is a lot easier to understand, and that's the fact that column 15 have half-filled shells, meaning that following Hund's rule, the electrons are filled in each orbital like this, halfway filled. And that really just causes stability. So because these electrons want to maintain that stable state, they really don't want to go anywhere. And so it's going to require a lot more energy to remove those electrons. So nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen will have a higher ionization energy than oxygen. Typically assume oxygen would have the higher ionization energy, but that's not the case. Nitrogen would, just because it's in that half-filled stable state and it wants to maintain that state. Another concept you should be familiar with is the concept of electron affinity, and this is actually really easy to understand. The definition of electron affinity is the amount of energy required in order to add an electron to a gaseous atom. So it's, comp it's like the opposite of ionization energy, if you want to think about it like that. So uh, electron affinity increases as you go this way on the periodic table. So let's draw us a fake periodic table. All right, and let's say you've got like fluorine right here and you've got sodium right here. And this is a really rough sketch. Which one will have the greater electron affinity? Which one will have, and which one would want more electrons? The answer is fluorine. You can just look at this arrow and it will tell you what, what it would be. 
It also increases as you go up this way. So let's say you had chlorine. Chlorine would still have a greater, a greater electron affinity than chlorine. So just look at these arrows and help in, use that as a guide to help you determine which would have a higher electron affinity. All right, so you should also be aware of, since electron affinity is negative, that means it's an exothermic reaction. All right, so adding an electron to a gaseous atom would be exothermic. So keep that in mind. So to solve this type of problem, you need to know the formula C equals lambda nu, where lambda represents wavelength and nu represents frequency. And you need to know that the speed of light, or C, is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So you just plug and chug from here. 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second is equal to the wavelength, which we're trying to solve for, times the frequency, which is 4.0 times 10 to the 15th hertz. Or hertz are equivalent to seconds to the negative first power. So we'll just replace that so that our units cancel out nicely. And then we can set this equation equal to wavelength. So it would be 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by 4.0 times 10 to the 15 seconds to the negative first power. And you see that seconds cancel and you will get your wavelength in meters, which is the correct unit for wavelength. And you, dividing this out, you will get 75 nanometers. So, you need to know that the de Broglie wavelength is de Broglie wavelength is equal to Planck's constant, which is 6.62607 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second over momentum, which is equal to mass times velocity. And in this problem, you're given the velocity and the mass of the electron. You also need to know though that he gives you the mass in grams, but for these problems, mass needs to be in kilograms, so we can convert that to kilograms so that all of our units will cancel out properly. So 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28 grams divided by 1,000 grams gives you one kilogram. You get 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. So now we can plug all this information in. Plug in Planck's constant, which is 6.2607 times 10 to the negative 34, and then we divide by the mass, which is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, and we multiply that by the velocity, which was given to us, which is 5.97 times 10 to the six meters per second. And when we solve this problem, we get that the wavelength is 1.22 times 10 to the 9 meters or 0.122 nanometers. And that is the final answer. To be able to do this problem, you need to know that energy is equal to h nu, h being Planck's constant, which is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34, and nu being the frequency. However, this question gives you wavelength, so you need to put this equation in terms of wavelength. And you can do that by substituting c over lambda for nu because nu is equal to c over lambda so where lambda is wavelength and c is the speed of light which is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second so now that we have this equation we can plug in the information that was given to us in the problem 
and you need to realize that he gave you wavelength in centimeters, so we need to convert that into meters. Just do that by multiplying by 10 to the negative 2 meters, and we get 0 0.150 meters. So energy is equal to Planck's constant, or 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times the speed of light, which is 2.998 times 10 to the 8th over the lambda that we just found. So we'll plug that in right here. And then this will give you energy in joules. So when we work that out, we get that energy is equal to 1.32 times 10 to the negative 27 joules. But he wants the answer expressed in terms of kilojoules per mole, so we need to do some conversions. So 1.32 times 10 to the negative 27 joules. We'll divide that by 1,000 to get it into kilojoules. And it wants kilojoules per mole, so we will multiply by Avogadro's number to get it in the correct form. And when we do that, we get 7.97 times 10 to the negative 4 kilojoules per mole. And that is the final answer. Okay, so we're going to give you some advice that helped us to get A's on some of Roger's exams. And I don't know, my advice would be to go ahead and do print out blank copies of the notes and redo them as much as you can, and especially focus on the examples, because those are, those are old test questions that he asked. It always looks easy when Roger's is working out the problems in class, but you have to make sure you are able to do them on your own. Even, even the simplest problems, sometimes you'll notice that you'll make mistakes, and those mistakes believe it or not, Rogers will have like an answer to them on the exam. Oh, yeah. Doing the notes a second time will help you out a lot. Exactly. Okay, so advice number two, print out the learning objectives. Don't even print them out. Just look at them and try and see if you can... Go down the list and make sure you're able to do every single thing that's listed on there. Yeah, and make sure you, not only can you do them, but you understand them really, really well, like from the back of your head. Yeah, that's just and like a really helpful checklist of all the things that you need to know for the test, and then... At the bottom of each or at the bottom of each section section, there are questions from the from the book that you can work out to help you. And those actually really help. But if don't do what I did, which was save them until the weekend before the exam, because believe it or not, that kind of really hurts you more than helps you. You want to be working on chemistry every single day. It really does work on help. it for like an hour or two hours every single day, and then you'll won't be stressing out before the exam, and you'll be really prepared. That's how I got an A on one of my exams, and that's how Samira got an A on hers. So it really does help. 